have an esteemed panel assembled, both in the room and online, who I will introduce shortly. Um, Kaden, whenever you're ready, if we can bring up our Zoom guests. My name is Rebecca Shute. I am the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and it is a privilege and a pleasure to co-host today's panel with Integrity Initiatives International. And thanks to today's vote, they will officially be able to co-host in future. <laughs> um, today's panel examines the need for an international anti-corruption court, given lacunae uh, that exist between domestic, regional, transnational, and intergovernmental approaches. We have seen how far cooperation among and assistance between states on investigative and prosecutorial strategies has advanced. And yet, we still lack an independent standing mechanism with subject matter jurisdiction able to meet the challenges posed by corruption. So today's panel, we have gathered perspectives from regional, um, hybrid, um, and transnational fronts. And we aim to pull this together for the proposal for an international anti-corruption court. For our first speaker, and I will introduce our speakers in turn, and we will have only a limited time, unfortunately, for discussion, given the embarrassment of riches with our panel. But for our first speaker, we have who um, I think can be rightly called the father of the IACC agenda, Judge Mark Wolf. Um, our organizations both are committed to the goal of an IACC, mine from the perspective of a more than 75-year-old organization that has advanced global cooperation, including through the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. And now today, Judge Wolf brings that forward as the Chair of Integrity Initiatives International. He's a senior United States District Judge and the former Chief Judge of the District of Massachusetts. He was recently a senior fellow of the Harvard Carr Center for Human Rights. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations and an adjunct lecturer and public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And if you can gauge from how quickly I'm speaking, it's because I do not want to detract any time from our speakers. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over the floor to Judge Mark Wolf, Chair of Integrity Initiatives International, who is joining us remotely. Rebecca, thank you very much. And I regret that I am uh, addressing you remotely from the courthouse in Boston because until this morning, Turkey had vetoed uh, the participation of Integrity Initiatives International on the utterly unsupported, spurious claim that we advocate for terrorism, uh, where actually the problem is that we have advocated uh, for the persecuted Turkish judges in Turkey, and uh, also because of our mission of striving to strengthen the enforcement of criminal laws against kleptocrats. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with some old friends and colleagues and so many new ones and potential new ones. I mentioned in part uh, Claudia Escobar, a vice chair of Integrity Initiatives International, Maria Wilson, who is an engine of our uh, campaign coordinating committee and the committee drafting a treaty for the International Anti-Corruption Court, and uh, Fernando Iglesias, a uh, 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 leading advocate for COPA, a regional anti-corruption court. Uh, by brief way of introduction of myself, uh, many years ago, as a very young lawyer, I was an assistant to the Attorney General of the United States after Watergate and introduced uh, to the challenges of holding the highest officials accountable for their criminal conduct in a democracy. Five years later, I was the chief federal prosecutor, United States prosecutor in Massachusetts, where corruption had been found to be a way of life. And after we won about 45 consecutive corruption cases, many against high officials in the city of Boston or their close confederates, I was appointed one of 850 United States judges uh, in my country. And I mention this because in the United States, we generally do not prosecute corrupt state and local officials in state courts. Rather, we prosecute them in federal courts, which have the right laws, which have the capacity uh, in the federal government to conduct complex investigations and prosecutions, uh, 
and uh, to effectively uh, prosecute and punish corrupt leaders. Uh, th this group really doesn't need uh, any explanation of the devastating consequences of grant corruption, but I think they're worth very brief mention. Uh, of course, grant corruption, the abuse of public office for private gain, and corruption generally. Uh, which we'll be discussing, because the International Anti-Corruption Court would only be at the apex of a continuum of improved and uh, innovative institutions that are necessary to combat corruption more effectively. Uh, but it grand corruption, the focus of III, uh, has devastating consequences. Corruption generally costs uh, developing countries 10 times more than they get in foreign aid, as Navi Pile, a supporter of the International Anti-Corruption Court, said when she was UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, corruption kills. Uh, the amount lost to corruption each year could feed the world's hungry 80 times over. We saw this as my another of the III co-chairs, vice chairs, Richard Goldstone of South Africa, and I predicted in an article in 2020 uh, a great deal of the COVID money was stolen by kleptocrats and their collaborators with impunity. Uh, we predict that the same will happen with much of the climate funding uh, uh, that's going to, as we estimated, 42% of it, $100 billion a year to some of the most corrupt countries in the world. Refugees are fleeing failed or failing states led by kleptocrats. Democracy is utterly undermined by corruption, and it presents grave threats to international peace and security. It's not a domestic issue, as you all know. You also know that uh, this grand corruption doesn't thrive in many countries because of a lack of laws. 185 members of the United Nations are parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption. They're all obligated to have, and almost all of them do have, laws making bribery, embezzlement of public funds, misappropriation of public property, money laundering and obstruction of justice, a crime. And they have international obligations to enforce those statutes against even their highest uh, leaders. But those leaders, corrupt leaders, kleptocrats, generally have impunity in their own countries because they control the police, the prosecutors, and the courts. Uh, there's no alternative now, effective alternative, to domestic prosecutions. Uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States and its 42 OECD Convention Against Bribery uh, counterparts, uh, with the rarest exception, maybe one, permit only the prosecution of people who or individuals or organizations that pay bribes not the kleptocrats who demand them. So the International Anti-Corruption Court would fill a crucial gap in the international framework for combating corruption. It's intended to give integrity uh, to the laws uh, that virtually every country have as required by the UNCAC. It would enforce those five laws or uniform, well, those five laws, domestic laws, uh, that I just mentioned that are required by the UNCAC or a uniform uh, counterpart of them. It would prosecute high officials of uh, countries and importantly, uh, their private co-conspirators, the individuals and organizations that pay bribes and the enablers to launder the money, the lawyers, the bankers, the real estate agents. The International Anti-Corruption Court would be a court of last resort. It would operate on the principle of complementarity. Therefore, only leaders of countries that are unwilling to prosecute their corrupt leaders. And I mentioned Vladimir Putin, but he's only one of many men. Uh, those countries that are unwilling to prosecute their corrupt leaders would be susceptible to having those leaders prosecuted in the International Anti-Corruption Court. In addition, there are countries that are willing but unable to prosecute uh, their present or former highest officials. At the moment, 
uh, Moldova, for example, is willing to do that, having a long history of grand corruption, but doesn't have the capacity. So former Moldovan officials and their private enablers, co-conspirators, would also be vulnerable to prosecution in the International Anti-Corruption Court. The court would be very valuable to the victims of grand corruption. Sentences, uh, if, if a defendant is found guilty in a fair trial, uh, sentences would include not just uh, uh, imprisonment, but an order of restitution or disgorgement that uh, would recover and repatriate, possibly in some circumstances, repurpose stolen assets for the benefit of the victims. And the capacity to do that would be greatly enhanced if the International Anti-Corruption Court has, as we're exploring, a counterpart to the United States False Claims Act, which permits private suits by whistleblowers on behalf of the government and uh, compensates them uh, richly if they settle or prevail in those cases or if they're taken over by the U.S. Department of Justice, which settles or prevails in them. And in 2019, these False Claims Act cases in the United States recovered $3 billion for the United States Treasury. The, uh, the International Anti-Corruption Court uh, would also have very valuable benefits uh, in other ways. It would result in the imprisonment of kleptocrats, corrupt leaders. It would create the opportunity, sir, not the certainty, but the opportunity for the democratic process uh, to produce successors who are honest and want to serve their citizens rather than enrich themselves. And very importantly, because this is a fundamental premise of the criminal laws, it would have a strong deterrent effect. Corruption is a crime of calculation. And when kleptocrats calculate that they can steal substantial sum of mo sums of money and there's no threat of credible sanctions to discourage them, they'll do it. So this is ultimately a preventive measure. There are two common questions uh, that arise regarding, well, there are more than two, but two common questions that arise concerning the International Anti-Corruption Court are, is how can it be effective? Because kleptocrats will never permit their own countries to join the court. It's not, actually not necessary that they do. And I don't want to focus unduly on Vladimir Putin, but again, it's an obvious example. It's axiomatic that kleptocrats don't keep their illicit funds largely in their own countries. They use the international financial system to launder the money. So our friends and colleagues in the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists in the Panama Papers provided overwhelming evidence that Vladimir Putin has laundered hundreds of millions of dollars and probably more into and through Switzerland. And let's say, uh, hypothetically, that uh, some of that money went to London, where many of his Russian oligarch pals uh, have... Uh, good parts of their illicit fortunes. If the UK, where the International Anti-Corruption Court has been endorsed by the Labour Party, uh, that uh, is likely to elect the prime minister next year, if the UK joins the International Anti-Corruption Court and Russia does not, and the UK doesn't want to prosecute Vladimir Putin itself, it could defer to the International Anti-Corruption Court. And the same would apply to Switzerland. The other uh, common but recently muted uh, question or argument against the court is it's a totally logical but politically impossible ideal. Uh, as I say, that's muted because now there's a declaration signed by more than 300 world leaders, including more than 50, 50 former presidents and prime ministers, two present presidents calling for creation of the court. The European Parliament has endorsed creation of the court. It's part of the official foreign policies of Canada and the Netherlands. And I hope Carolyn uh, Byers uh, from the Netherlands is in the room now. Uh, it's also 
uh, was endorsed uh, first by Colombia and then in two administrations. We hope soon a third uh, by Ecuador, by Nigeria, and most recently by uh, also Moldova. A number of African countries have privately expressed support for the court and uh, hopefully will soon make that public. And this is very important because it's always been our view and it's the view of uh, many of the countries I just mentioned that this has to be uh, a court uh, that shaped and serves the interests of the global South and all parts of the world, not a Western initiative, not a global North initiative. And that's proving to be the case. We now have uh, a committee of uh, 42 international criminal law experts drafting a treaty for the court. And um, uh, many of them are from uh, the global South and elsewhere. Uh, so there are also 75 NGOs that have signed a declaration calling for the court. And it's my hope that uh, others in the room now and your colleagues will also join this rapidly progressing effort to create the crucially, urgently needed international anti-corruption court. So I thank uh, uh, Rebecca and uh, the Citizens for Global Solution for organizing this, for offering us the opportunity to co-sponsor. And I very much look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you so much, Judge Wolf, for starting us off with that inspiring keynote. And for any um, of those who represent states delegations, but also all of those from civil society who are here in the room, uh, we hope that you'll come up to us afterwards to, to discuss how you can be a part of this movement to create an international anti-corruption court. Um, it is now my it's a privilege to introduce the vice chair of III, Judge Claudia Escobar, who is a former magistrate of the Court of Appeals of Guatemala. Um, she's now a distinguished visiting scholar at the SCAR School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Um, following her second election to the Court of Appeals in 2014, she became the lead whistleblower in a case of grand corruption that revealed illegal interference in Guatemala's judiciary by high-ranking political officials including the country's vice president and the former president of Congress. She is the co-founder of several organizations dedicated to promoting the rule of law in Guatemala and following a series of threats that she received has relocated to the United States. It is a privilege to have you on our panel today, Dr. Escobar. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor for me to join this, this panel. I would like to talk about a hybrid mechanism that probably some of you have heard about is the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, CICIC, that worked in the country for a few years. First of all, I'll give you a little bit of background of Guatemala. Guatemala, as many of you know, is a small country. It's a post-conflict country. The peace accord were signed in December 1996. The legacy of the civil war was a lot of impunity, inequity, and insecurity, or, or violence, like the triple I, <laughs> but in, in the bad sense. Um, the judicial system was very weak, and there was a lack of judicial independence during that time. Its geographical uh, location facilitates a lot of illegal uh, commerce from south to north. According to INL, to the State Department, many areas of the country, especially along Guatemala borders, are under the influence of drug trafficking organizations. Guatemala confronts an array of transnational criminal organizations evolving in alien smuggling, trafficking in persons, money laundering, arms trafficking, and extortion. So, when the country wanted to fight all these problems, they find themselves that the institutions were weak and they could not do it. So in 2009, a hybrid mechanism to fight corruption and impunity was created by the UN and the government of Guatemala. It's the International Commission Against Impunity, known as CICIC. It started functioning the country in 2007, the same year that I was appointed as a judge. CICIC mandate was terminated in September 2018, after they investigated more than 300 cases of grand corruption. So we need to think when a country needs an international hybrid mechanism to fight corruption. I think there are, there are some signs when, when this can happen. Um, 
because they can help to update legal framework to ask them to address corruption cases when the institutions are very weak, when the judicial institutions cannot really address the problem of impunity. When there is a, a lack of influence or control of the judiciary by the executive or the legislative, and also from other sectors like organized crime. Because sometimes organized crime is so powerful that they infiltrate um, national institutions, national organizations. And even though there are honest uh, officials in, in the institutions, they are afraid because they are many, many times threatened uh, for their work. So when all this happened, we have a situation of endemic corruption. That's something that is happening in Guatemala right now. If you see the news in the New York Times today, they're talking about how difficult it is to go um, transform the, the country and transit to democracy. Right now they are fighting the, the last elections because they don't want to, they, the, all these sectors don't, don't want to allow an honest um, president to take over. So when these criminal alliance sometimes are, are very difficult to, to understand, but in Guatemala, they, they are um, organized criminal gangs members, drug cartels in this alliance together with kleptocratic leaders, people in Congress, in the executive, judges from higher courts, public officials from different institutions are um, in this uh, alliance that we call corrupt, corruption. There's also violators of human rights that are um, former army people that fought during the civil war and also economic elites that have used the system to enrich themselves because they don't pay taxes, they pay very low wages, and they don't want to lose those privileges. And they all benefit from impunity and from the lack of the rule of law. So what a, a, a hybrid mechanism can do is first of all, try to modernize the institutions they can help to strengthen judicial institutions in different aspects, like creating capacities. They also can accompany and empower judicial officials to carry out their work, because it's not the same to be a judge or a prosecutor in Germany, in Canada, in other countries, like being a, a public official in a country that is extremely violent. So an international mechanism can help empower these officials. And they can also protect them from threats, from terror retaliation. And I have seen, I have witnessed how CICIC work in Guatemala, how they really help to investigate cases and to empower judicial officials. And I think at this moment, um, even though CICIC was in the country for 12 years, the backlash has been terrible in the last five years. And that's why I, I really advocate for uh, the creation of an international anti-corruption court, because I think it's going to be the only way to tackle um, high level officials that are using corruption to enrich themselves. Thank you, Dr. Escobar. And I think it is worth remembering that CICIG uh, did uh, help dismantle more than 70 criminal structures during its existence. But what has come after um, is perhaps um, equally as, as horrifying. So moving from a hybrid approach to a regional approach, um, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker who's joining us virtually online, um, Professor Fernando Iglesias. Um, uh, Fernando is the co-president of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, um, in a capacity he served in since 2018. He's previously served as a member of Parliament of Argentina from 2007 to 2011, and again from 2017 to 2021. And he's the director of the Campaign for a Latin American and Caribbean Criminal Court Against Transnational Organized Crime, or COPLA. Um, he's also the co-chair of the UN Parliamentary Assembly's campaigns, a parliamentary advisory group on that topic. He's a founding member of Democracia Global and directs the Alterio Spinelli Chair for Regional Integration um, uh, at the uh, World Federalist Movement member organization based in Italy. Uh, so, uh, Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hi from Buenos Aires. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks to Jan, Rebecca, and Dr. Wolf for this uh, invitation, which is a pleasure and an, an honor. Excuse me because of the connection, because I, I had a problem with the internet connection with my computer, so I changed it to my phone, and this is what it is. <laughs> so I will try to be 
short and uh, as clear as possible. Well, I I I I would try to to answer some questions about the copla. The first one is what is copla about? Copla is Corte Penal Latinoamericana y del Caribe contra el crimen transnacional organizado, which is Latin American and Caribbean Court against transnational organized crime. The proposal is about creating uh, a court under the ICC model, more, more or less, dedicated to prosecute uh, in a complementary way uh, the crimes, uh, transnational crimes uh, organized by mafias and, on, on, and this kind of organization. And this is based, uh, uh, the difference with the International Criminal Court is the International Criminal Court is based on, the, on a particular treaty, the Rome Institute, and the COPLA we are proposing, the code we are proposing, uh, is based on the Palermo Convention. The Palermo Convention is a general agreement, a document of the United Nations about the fight against organized crime uh, that was signed by most of the countries which are part of the uh, of the United Nations. Where so basically, what we are proposing to create a code which makes the enforcement of the Palermo Convention that most of the countries have signed, particularly um, the Latin American countries. All Latin American countries countries have signed are signatories of the Palermo Convention, so they have a um, commitment in front of their communities, but also in front of the international community to fight against transnational organized crime. And that is COPLA about. Why regional? Why Latin America? Well, of course, transnational organized crime is by definition global. It happens all over the world. Um, and But Latin America has a sad record. This is the most violent uh, continent in the world, far away from any other uh, uh, other continent, um, and this is a real problem. You know, uh, when we look at uh, Mexico and Brazil, uh, let me remark that Mexico is half of Central America and Brazil is half of South America. The two biggest countries of the region have really serious problems. About uh, when I say really serious problems, I mean that in Europe the average of people who is murdered in by violence and by crime is about two or three in 100,000. And in Brazil and Mexico is about 10 times more. But we are speaking about 60,000 uh, dead people because of violence, mostly by uh, violence organized by criminals in Brazil and half of that, about 30,000 in Mexico. These were the records. The situation now is getting a little a little better, but the menace is uh, enormous. Uh, and the dangers for democracy, the danger for uh, human rights, the danger for uh, the um, economic development uh, is, is uh, and the, the damage of all of these um, things are uh, still very high, and the menace of the expansion towards the rest of South America and the rest of Central America is really critical. Of course, we have other realities like Venezuela or, or Nicaragua and Guatemala, which are very critical too. But let me uh, remark, let me underline the situation of the two biggest countries of the region in which the situation is uh, really critical. Um, the model of COPLA, you can, I cannot speak for a long time, so you can check it uh, in the internet. The webpage is coalicioncopla.org, coalicioncopla.org, and you have there the, um, the progress made by the campaign, the support we had, the governments which are part of the board, the the support of parliamentarians and international figures, etc. Um, but the basic idea is 
uh, even if uh, the transnational organized crime is global, the situation in Latin America is critical. So we can find some kind of support to start a process here. And let's see what happens. My idea is uh, if this is a successful experiment by Latin America, this could be the origin of different regional courts or might be of a global court against um, uh, corruption uh, could, could start at the international level. This is when I was communicating at the beginning of the campaign this idea, I was in Italy with uh, one of my friends, Emma Bonino. She was at that time the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the first thing she told me was, oh, it's OK, it's a very good idea, but please be, uh, be very prudent about the possibility of uh, so avoid the, the regionalization of the idea. And I agree, we should, the idea of COPLA in Latin America should be only a, a first step towards a, something more developed because the, the, pro, the trouble, uh, the problem, the crisis uh, about the, the international uh, and transnational crime is uh, basically global. Well, what else? Well, about the... The international. Uh, what are the crimes? We 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 don't want. We avoided to discuss the the kind of crimes. Uh, we a cop a court like this sh uh, should judge, uh, and we adopted the the Palermo Convention because all Latin American countries are signatories, and because it's very clear, it's about uh, um, drug uh, traffic of drugs, traffic of human beings traffic of wild animals, and also it's about transnational corruption. Uh, one of the crimes which are directly connected with the predominance and the expansion of international organization, criminal organization, is corruption. And of course, uh, in particular in Mexico, but also in Brazil, uh, they have their representatives inside the political system, and they are corrupt. And that's why I see a complementarity uh, between um, the COPLA project and the International Anti-Corruption Court um, project, uh, they are complementary because if we are uh, capable of uh, fixing this problem at the national, at the Latin American level, of course, this is a contribution to fight uh, against uh, corruption all over the world. And of course, the contrary. This was a uh, a uh, very friendly talk we had with uh, Dr. Wolf five years ago when we both visited Colombia in order to, to explain uh, the two projects. And our conclusion was very clear that it would be a very good news for the fight against corruption, the existence of uh, a, a copla in Latin America. And it will be a very good, very good news for the fight against transnational organized crime if an uh, uh, international anti-corruption core is created in the in the coming years. Um, Thank and you, I, Fernando. Think, I think in the interest of time, um, I'll ask you if you could yeah. conclude your remarks there, and hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion. Um, okay. But in terms of complementarity of these approaches and cooperation in terms of subject matter jurisdiction, I think you hit on some very important points. I don't know how many of us in the room uh, were at the Assembly of States Parties to the International Criminal Court last week, but that's where I spent uh, my time right before Atlanta. And there is certainly a lot of room uh, for discussion about how these different mechanisms can work together for the greater good. I think we have one conversation, or excuse me, one uh, question already in the Q&A online um, that gestures to that, that I hope we have time to get to. For those of you who are joining us remotely, the information on COPLA is also in the chat function. And anybody who would like that link in person, um, I am very happy to, to give that to you as well. But next I'm introducing Hilary Forden, who is a lawyer and development practitioner with more than 15 years of experience in rule of law development, post-conflict justice and criminal law. She's currently with the Carter Center where she serves as senior associate director. 
She's previously consulted for the Department of State and USAID-funded anti-corruption and legal education projects. Um, she was a senior technical advisor with the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative and previously worked for INL. And I'm just going to run out of breath there with your bio <laughs> and go on and give you the floor. Please, Hillary. Mm -hmm. All right, hello, is that working? All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about how um, kind of lessons learned um, from international development um, assistance around anti-corruption and transnational organized crime can um, contribute to and hopefully inform the design of future mechanisms um, to combat corruption, such as an international anti-corruption court or a regional mechanism like COPLA. Um, so one thing, courts obviously occupy a unique place in the fight against corruption because they can be both part of the problem as well as an important part of the solution. Um, so obviously courts have an essential role in holding corrupt actors both criminally or and civilly accountable um, for their actions but at the same time people don't want to use courts that they perceive to be corrupt and unfortunately in a lot of countries today that is the case um, in fact even yesterday i heard in one of the panels a um, statistic that 84 percent of women and girls who have experienced gender-based violence in Haiti believe that the courts are corrupt and therefore do not use them to seek redress for their grievances um, so thinking about from that perspective uh, one of the first things that um, a new court that focuses on anti-corruption can do is put its own house in order. And there's growing evidence that indirect approaches to addressing corruption, um, such as those around transparency, accountability, access to information, and good governments, um, can actually be more effective in addressing corruption and maybe more preferable um, than direct anti-corruption approaches. So thinking about a court of this kind, um, some things that should be maybe pre Requisites or like the first steps would be setting, putting in place ethical standards, codes of conduct, vetting of judges and staff, um, transparent case management systems um, that are publicly available, digitization of court processes, um, and increasing public access to information, um, as well as strengthening internal governance um, mechanisms and recruitment and personnel processes. Um, Another thing that is really, I um, think, has been recognized in recent years is the need for people-centered justice, which means that as we develop um, a mechanism of this kind, we need to think about um, and ensure that anti-corruption ad efforts address people's day-to-day -day justice needs and are really rather than looking first at the court, looking at what is it that is needed by people to address anti-corruption needs and justice needs. And, and I think this is particularly relevant in the anti-corruption space because we keep hearing like, um, you know, anti-corruption is not a victimless crime. And I think a lot of approaches in the past have taken it as such. Um, and, and we need to step back, I think, with other international criminal courts, there's a recognition that there are, you know, thousands you know, of victims, but with corruption, we don't necessarily think of that right away, and we should. And so um, any anti-corruption court should be people-centered. That means it needs to be user-friendly, solution-focused, prevention-oriented, data-driven, and focused on problem-solving. Um, and I think international assistance can help with this. Um, another thing is uh, looking at technical assistance uh, versus the idea of thinking and working politically. Um, obviously, like a lot of in the past, a lot of uh, development assistance in the anti-corruption space has focused on technical capacity building and assistance to the justice sector, um, but that is not always going to be a solution, especially when we're dealing with corruption. And so, um, so while technical assistance may be necessary, for example, when we're dealing with complex um, issues such as certain aspects of financial crimes, money laundering, um, asset forfeiture, uh, network analysis, or maybe RICO type cases, 
Um, there also needs to be a look at kind of a political economy analysis and identifying um, where like the process of understanding the complex web of individuals and entities that promote and oppose reforms and um, whether that be a reform in terms of a new court or um, other activities to address corruption, um, both at the local as well as the global level. And um, so I'm thinking about, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, and so um, we need, but at the same time, we need to think politically without being perceived as political by local stakeholders. And I think for a new international anti-corruption court, I think that is important that it not be perceived as a political entity, but rather as a justice institution. Um, and the other thing I wanted to um, sort of look at is that uh, do no, our do no harm principles, um, because uh, we find that um, that you know technical assistance in particular um, at us, particularly at the national level, we've seen can actually be um, can actually be harmful because it can actually strengthen um, institutions to support authoritarian regimes. And at, in, at an international anti-corruption court, that is less likely, but you can still see um, there's still the potential for harm. And so I think we need to ask ourselves this question about, um, about you know, what are the potential risks and how do we mitigate those risks? Um, and then generally, I think um, foreign assistance, even uh, when looking at an international anti-corruption court or a regional body, um, should still take a multi-sectoral approach, um, which means that international foreign assistance to um, such a court should not be limited to the court itself, but rather support all the structures around it. So looking at support to journalists and civil society organizations that can hold even an international um, anti-corruption court accountable and um, as well as support to providing legal assistance, um, both to victims um, and those who have been harmed by corruption, but also ensuring um, that, you know, if there are people, um, you know, defendants before the court who do prove to be indigent at the point of which that they're brought before the court, that, you know, they have access to a defense. Um, I realize that's, you know, the level of indigency when you're dealing with a corruption court is probably going to be lower than it in, like the ICC or another international criminal tribunal, but it's still something to consider. Um, Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, can I just say one last thing? And then that is that I think um, we need to, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So thinking about international criminal, um, international corruption as a transnational problem. So one of the things to really keep in mind is a lot of times these international criminal tribunals have been established in part to avoid um, influ political influence or um, security threats within the country where um, the crimes occurred. But obviously, because corruption is transnational, those threats potentially exist anywhere this court is established, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you so much, Hillary. And um, I'll, I'll do a little bit of promotion on behalf of the Carter Center. Thank you to the Carter Center, who's hosting a full docket of uh, civil society side events. Tomorrow from 12 to 5, it is off-site. It will be worth your while. We can give you a link to register um, online in the chat. And for anybody who would like to do so in person, um, please come see us. We can register you. Our final speaker is Justice Maria Wilson. She's a Justice of Appeal of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago. She's a former trial lawyer at the International Criminal Court and also at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And she's a former assistant director of public prosecution in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rebecca. What is very clear from this discussion thus far is that what we have in common is we all want to find ways of bringing corruption to an end. Now, in relation to the International Anti-Corruption Court, um, are you able to hear me, Rebecca? Yes? Yes, very loud and clear. In relation to the International Anti-Corruption Court, the purpose behind it is to fulfill an enforcement gap in the international framework for combating grand corruption. 
And we intend this court not to be a political entity, but to be truly um, inclusive, not to be a Western court, but to be a court where everyone works together to really fight corruption. As Judge Wolf indicated, corruption has devastating effects. And it was um, Fernando also referred to that de devastating effect as well as Dr. Escobar. So because of the transnational nature of the crime, it's, it's imperative to have an international court and this is missing. Um, we envisage an uh, international anti-corruption court as having two chambers, the criminal and civil. The criminal will be to prosecute persons responsible for grand corruption. It will be based on the complementarity principle like the ICC, which basically means that individuals will only, the court will only have jurisdiction over individuals if the state is unable and unwilling to prosecute wrongdoers. Now, in, we have been working on the model, a model treaty, and as results, some international experts got in together in August 23, and that, will, that continues, and again, we'll meet in August 24. And the type of issues we've been working on is the temporal jurisdiction of the court, the territorial jurisdiction of the court, the core crimes, um, and the persons who will be um, subject to the jurisdiction of the court, immunities, um, cooperation. It has been, we have had the input of international experts and we look forward to NGOs and other states also in fact uh, contributing. We see this court has been very court cost effective. We, less, from lessons learned from other tribunals, we feel that that is the way to go. How would this be achieved? By procedures being less, less complex and protracted, by there being no pretrial chamber, by the number of active judges serving that, that will be based on the court, ongoing court cases, using fines to defray some of the costs of the court. Um, ideally, we see the state parties being involved will include states where there's an international financial centers, because they will have a pivot, pivotal part to play. In relation to the civil chamber, we see that as a separate function and purpose. And the purpose of that is really to, to consider contested issues um, related to looted assets representing proceeds of crime. So we are aware there's Article 66 on, on CAC, which provides for the settlement of disputes in relation by our arbitration, and eventually a resort can be had to the International Criminal Justice Court. But we see that there can be a rule for the uh, International Anti-Corruption Court. One of, the, one of the issues people always raise with me is, I mean, what about the regional um, mechanisms? Why can't we rely on that? Why do we need an International Criminal Court, an in, International Anti-Corruption um, Court? And the reason for that has been clearly demonstrated by what Dr. Escobar has stated. So you can have all the best intentions, and at the end of the day, you have certain very powerful forces to deal with. You have the, the um, criminal organizations, you have the corruption in the form of judicial officers. So there comes a point where there's a limit to what some of those regional organizations can do. And in fact, they will benefit and we will benefit from having to work with such organizations. And through their support, we can work together to really address this uh, corruption issue. Um, so I, I thought it was very useful what um, Dr. Escobar shared with us and the fact that um, she felt that international and international, international organizations such as the IACC can protect such organizations, hybrid organizations from threats um, and from corruption. It, it, it makes it more easy for that organization to deal with such issues. So we see that there's a lot of potential and the way to go is to have an international body. The crime is transnational in nature so we need to work together with other state entities to really uh, address the issue of corruption. I think that every good, um, every reality be, begins with, with, a, with an idea, with a thought. And we have had that, this idea of establishing an in, international anti-corruption court. And we see it as becoming a reality and we are working towards it to become a reality. 
and we ask you to come on board and work with us. We welcome your ideas in discussing the jurisdiction of the court and what, what part we can play and the regional organization can play in working together with us and for us to fight the whole concept of corruption. We are all in the same space wanting the same results. And I feel that we could come together. I appreciated what Hillary had to say as well. And I think there is no reason why we can't all come together to establish such a court. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Wilson. Um, and that is a very fitting segue to one question that we've received online. Um, we are at time, but by a show of hands, I would like to welcome a couple of interventions um, from the floor if we have any in person. The question that we have online was from Kirk Boyd, who's the executive director of the Legal Pact for the Future, which is how an international anti-corruption court would interact with regional entities. He gave the specific example of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. One could think of the European Court of Human Rights or other bodies as well. So while our panelists uh, germinate on that question, I will just look around and see if there are any other interventions that would like to be taken from the floor. Okay, who would like to take the question on regional cooperation? It's hard to see who's off mute online. <laughs> so I, uh, yes, Judge Wolf, please, thank you. I think we were all necessarily uh, speaking quickly, but there's a common theme. The International Anti-Corruption Court is one of only institutions one of many institutions that are necessary to effectively combat and diminish uh, corruption. Uh, it's essential that it work closely with any regional courts that can be established and with national courts. And in our view, the International Anti-Corruption Court would be a kind of super CSIG with expert investigators, prosecutors, and judges available to strengthen the capacity of national entities. Regional courts would be very desirable, but this is anecdotal, but perhaps illuminating. Uh, in 2018, the Organization of American States Summit was in Peru. Uh, co colleagues of ours in III spoke to the Peruvian uh, foreign minister and asked him to put on the agenda of the OAS summit creating a regional anti-corruption court, a criminal court. He could not even get it on the agenda. And that suggested to me that the kleptocrats who dominate their countries also dominate their neighborhoods. There have been proposals for 10 years to create an African regional court. We firmly support the creation of regional courts for essential to have the range of institutions necessary to combat corruption, but it may be that there, it's even more challenging to establish a regional court than it will prove to be to create an international anti-corruption court. Thank you, Judge Wolf. I think that's a fitting note on which to conclude. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in the room for your stamina and your perseverance staying into the evening. But I'd especially like to thank the team from III, particularly uh, Managing Director, Director of Programs, Ian Lynch and Sarah Jessup, who really are the uh, powers behind the scenes who have brought this panel together. And thank you, of course, to the esteemed panelists here in the room and those who have joined us online. We hope to continue the conversation and that next year you will be in person as a co-host um, now that we have had the historic vote of this morning. Thank you all. Thank you.